All right. So welcome everyone uh, to another iteration of our real estate investment club. Uh, Daniel, our usual host, is out today, unfortunately. Uh, now it's no secret that I'm no Daniel, but I'll do my best to facilitate. Um, so today uh, we have uh, David uh, McElwain uh, from, is it Mac, Mac Assets? Mac Assets. Mac Assets, okay, from Mac Assets. Uh, he will be talking to us on the emotional journey of evicting a tenant. Um, and uh, just to give you a quick background on this session, or not a background on the session, but a couple of house rules. So I know last time we met, we did a panel discussion. This is back to our original format where it's it's one speaker presenting and I will help moderate. Uh, we are back to using the chat for questions. So uh, whenever a question comes up, please uh, put it in the chat and then I will uh, funnel them through to uh, to David to make sure to get them answered. Um, and without further ado, uh, David, please take it away. I appreciate that, Dennis. Thank you. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining. I've got a little PowerPoint and I'm talking to you from an airport power rental drop off in Kansas City. So if there's any technical glitches, I'm gonna blame the Kansas City Airport Association. And uh, first I'd like to say, uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point in time, because I, what I really want is a conversation that allows for everybody to have the questions answered. Uh, I put together a little PowerPoint, and if I can figure out how to share my screen, I will share it with you. And I'm not a Teams user, so I apologize in advance for that. Should be a button um, on the top right. Right next to where it's so I'm on the, there should be a button that says share content with a little up arrow. Ah, open share tray. Okay. Perfect. All right, so is that working? Uh yep. Yep, that's it. Awesome. So what I wanted to talk about was the emotional journey of how how you go through evicting a a tenant and what that's like. The reason this topic came up is that Daniel and I were having a conversation and I walked him through some of the experiences I had last summer. From that conversation, this was born. And I also think about it as, oh no, I got a problem. What do I do to handle this? But before I kind of go into that, I thought I'd give you a little bit of background on who I am, why do you care what I have to say, and what value can I add for you? So the first part is I've been there and I've made the mistake. I'm a corporate sales executive who has 20 plus years in the corporate world. I worked for a division of CBS and Viacom in the advertising space. During that period of time, I did a lot of what you on the call are doing, which is taking, taking my income and diversifying it into more than one revenue stream, including owning and investing real estate. I've been doing that for over 20 years. I've owned a whole bunch of different categories of investments. I own single family, I own multifamily, I've owned some strip mall retail, I did a VRBO, I had second homes, I've been a limited partner in more than 200 units, a general partner in over 400 units. I've done self-managed portfolio, I actually am a licensed real estate broker and own a brokerage in Colorado since 2014. So I feel like I am stupidly dangerous on what I do and do not know. With that said, I wanted to talk about some of the biggest mistakes. And like I said, feel free to interrupt me at any moment in time if you have questions. So some of the biggest mistakes I've made in managing and dealing and working with tenants are really mistakes that are about being liked, being wanted to be liked, and not wanting to create friction. Um, I had a tenant one time who was fighting with another tenant, and I couldn't figure out who was lying. And so I ignored it. I avoided the confrontation. And one person was complaining about the other. The other person was complaining about the first person. There were allegations of sexual assault. I told the person who made the allegations, call the police. Nothing happened. Um, I very much believe in mis when you make mistakes that you refer to the authorities as much as you can. Because my job as a landlord is not to create uh, or affect laws. My job is to have the people who create and affect the laws handle that. Big mistake in avoiding confrontation. If there's a problem, I 
I used to tend to ignore it, hoping it would go away. That strategy doesn't often work. People often think of the police as risk points. From a landlord's point of view, a, a police relationship is a really beneficial thing. And I had to learn that the hard way. Um, much like corporate America, if you have cancerous tenants, you've got to deal with them immediately. Not raising rents aggressively is also a mistake I've made several times. And creating personal relationships with tenants is a mistake I've made. Much like in corporate America, there are HR rules around treating all employees and all peers the same and having a relationship that is uh, driven by a quality of behavior. It's the same in real estate. Creating favoritism always creates mistakes. And one of my other big mistakes has been being too linear and not creative in what I do to solve problems. And so thinking the same solution is going to work every time. And that isn't always the case. Often the solutions are very unique to the situation. And I think um, I had to learn that the hard way. So in July of 2020, I was awoken from the police while I was at my parents' house. And the phone call basically was, hey, your tenant just killed themselves. And I didn't know what to do with that. My tenant had been a tenant in this property for four or five years. She was mentally ill. She had been unemployed. And this was the unemployment started and the illness started and the eviction process started long before COVID. So this did not have anything to do with the pandemic. It was other than timing. The police was really polite and said to me, yeah, she left a note right on top of your eviction papers. And I was devastated. Uh, I'd known this person for a long time. I knew she was struggling with her own demons and I didn't know what to do. And then I thought, how did I get to this point? And after I processed through that, I tried to get to, how do I get past this point? And that past this point is really kind of the focus of the rest of the conversation is what happens when things go really bad? And as things go really bad, uh, I'll jump a little bit to the ending. The first part of this is to recognize that it's not your fault. And so that was part of my journey as well. It was to recognize I wasn't responsible for part of what she did or part of what she did not choose to do. But as we start this problem, I'd love to hear from the audience as well on what fears come up, what thoughts come up, what questions come up immediately. One of the th things that happens with me is I think I've got a problem. Now what? And then I go through all these different types of concerns. Am I going to make somebody homeless? Am, am I going to miss my mortgage payment if they don't pay the rent? I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. I don't want to be mean. I don't want to be unliked. I don't want to be the, the slumlord that gets on the Channel 7 News for being the guy that won't fix something. Then I think, oh, if they don't pay the bill, I can't pay the bill. And then I think it's a pandemic. How can I do this? Or I've got a problem and the problem is, hey, this person's dealing drugs. This person's crazy. This person has a gun. This person is making accusations or threatening somebody else. And I've got an unsafe living environment. Does anybody have any other kinds of fears and concerns that immediately pop up in their brain when they think about a problem with tenants and the property? So feel free to yeah. unmute and just speak since we have a smaller group today or just put your uh, comments or questions in the chat. I can read them out. Destruction on the property. Destruction, that's a great one. I didn't even think about that. You're right. Uh oh, they're going to ruin my asset, right? There's another comment in the chat. How long the process is going to take? Yeah, fear of the unknown on time is definitely another one of the problems, right? And that creates a, in itself a re concern about return of investment, a concern about revenue streams, which ultimately comes back to am I going to miss a payment? And pain in the pain in the tail factor. What's this going to take me? How long is it going to deal with my emotional energy? And I've got other jobs to do, right? I think one for me is uh, if I've got a good tenant, but I need to be raising rents. Um, 
looking like the bad guy, looking like I'm getting greedy. Um, yeah. Being the good guy, you know, all of that. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I realized that the house or the property doesn't sit down and write the check to me every month. It's the tenant. And so I'm really investing in the tenant and trying to find the balance between the two. Uh huh. And there's that old adage that a good tenant is really super valuable and maybe worth losing some money over, right? Exactly. I mean, the cost of yeah. a turnover and a placement of a new tenant is quite expensive versus the 20 or 50 bucks you get extra in a month. So, Right. But one of the keys to that from a business point of view is it's not 20 bucks a month or 50 bucks a month. It's $240 or $600 a year. Yeah, yeah. Good point. And that's a, that's a big distinction that people have to go through is what's that year versus month analysis. Great problem. Any other problems that people come up and they say, uh-oh. I got a problem now. What? Yeah, there are a couple more in the chat. There's okay. one that says, um, "I got to get a lawyer involved. How much that's going to cost?" Uh, uh -huh. a comment that says, "I hire a property manager to handle this." Third <laughs> comment that says, um, "I felt guilty evicting a person struggling or losing battle with cancer." Yeah, this is those challenges of life, right? So I think we flushed out a bunch of those fears. And um, just to get some real quick solutions on the property management company, if you've got a property management company in place, I would not hesitate for a second to push back because as a vendor and a property management company, I'm paid to do a job. You guys are paid by Intel to do a job. And if you don't do the job, Intel is going to push back. Whoever that structure is, they're not going to let you work for free or they're not going to let you not work and pay you. And it's the same with property management. So remember that relationship. And then let's talk about eviction in the macro process. And I'm, the re, you'll see that I want to weave back in on these concerns as we go through it. So in the macro process of eviction, we start with three basic sections. A notice to the tenant. In other words, fix it. Then there's a cure period. Then there's a punishment stage. And the whole process is that we give the tenant multiple opportunities to fix an issue. And if they don't fix it, we've got communication. So I often start with, okay, there's the attorney concern, there's the, the energy drain concern, and then there's, I don't know the process. So I typically don't use attorneys to do this. I do this myself because I, feel, I find that I can negotiate quick and simple. I don't have to spend, spend the fees. However, if my time were more valuable or I were making $500 an hour as a landlord, I would hire an attorney to do this for $250 an hour under the cost benefit analysis. Do you think sometimes so uh, having an attorney come in might amplify the situation unnecessarily? Correct, it, yeah. it does. It definitely amplifies emotion. Now there are pros and cons. Another response is I have an attorney, let them deal with this. And I was talking to another co-investor uh, of mine and their first answer was, I don't evict somebody, somebody else does. I hire somebody to do that. Mm -hmm. I hire a management company, I hire a third party. So part of this goes into how do you want to go through these stages? And I'm not here to give advice on which way is the best way, but I will tell you that from an emotional side, I really respect the process and the process gives me the clarity to let the outcome not be my responsibility. It's the outcome of the tenant. And so what you'll see me build over the course of this presentation is some emotional boundaries around owning the outcome. So when I tell the, the tenant, fix it or clear the issue, I'm very much saying, okay, there's a problem. You, Mr. or Mrs. Tenant need to do A or B or C. And if you do A, B or C, we have no problem. If they choose not to do A, B or C, they've got formal notice and would go into what is defined by a municipality, whether it's your city, or your county or your state, typically it's a county controlled process. It's usually not city controlled. So the first thing that I do before I do it is read the county websites on eviction. And they're usually really clear. They tell us the process and there's a period of time with every process. So notice is either three to 10 days. A cure period could be anything from three to 21 days to 30 days. And then you go to the punishment stage. Hey, you haven't cured the problem. I've got to bring in another third party 
known as the courts. They're going to punish you for not doing what you said you're going to do. And remember that the entirety of this relationship is a contractual relationship between landlord and tenant. You give them a bill of a, a bundle of rights as a landlord that says you can use and enjoy this property within these rules and regulations. One of those rules and regulations is that you pay. One of them is you behave well. One of them is you don't damage my property. And one of them is that ultimately I am in charge. So as you think through that, if they've broken those rules and regulations, then that allows you as the owner or, or investor to have the third party be referee. It's no different than a football game. There's a referee out there. You got two teams that want to do the same thing, but you have a referee in the middle to make sure that they play by the rules. And that's what the court is. It's a referee. And if you think about it that way, it's a whole lot less possessive for me to say, I am the person doing this. What I am doing is I'm saying there's a document in place and someone has to follow it. If they don't follow the agreement, that's not up to me to say that they lied to me. That's up to the third party to say they lied to me. And that's a big part of the process. So within the emotional part, part of this, you've got a decision that happens multiple times, multiple times during this to go or no go forward. And that's what the earlier speaker mentioned about the attorney and the escalation. When you bring in the third party attorney, you may or may not have a go, no go decision. So in the sharing information stage, which is that we got a problem, you need to fix it, Mr. and Mrs. Tenant. There's a go or no go every time you give them a clear piece of communication, they listen, they respond, they fix it. Okay, you've created a boundary and there's no problem. You give them a, peer, a clear piece of communication and they ignore it, well then you have to make the next decision. Do I wanna push this forward? And you get to listen and evaluate to their response. And then you get to share information that is, hey, there's a period of time that, that the courts have established, a third party has made the rules, I didn't make the rules, and as an owner, I can really take those rules as a safety net. They're a security blanket. Um, following the rules is a great way to think about this. Once and then you get to the no, no go, the go, no go decision process before you get to punishment. And my objective is always to solve the problem before I get to the punishment stage. Now, in anything else, you can use the punishment stage like a lever and like a fear, like a, a fear mechanism. So you can say to the tenant, look, if you don't pay, I'm going to have no choice, but. And while that might seem like being a jerk, the reality is that what you're holding to them is the behavior of being an adult. As adults in this country, we have a commitment to pay our bills. When we sign a contract, the contract typically specifies that we have the knowledge and ability to enforce the contract and to enter it knowingly. Remember, as a landlord, that you're providing a service. In exchange for providing that service, you're entitled to be compensated for it. The service you're providing them is safe housing. And housing that doesn't have leaks, doesn't have damage, and is stable. If they don't fulfill their end of the bargain, take care of the property, follow your rules, pay your bills, there's a natural series of results. Then I think of reasons to evict in three different categories, behavioral, financial, and structural. So I imagine that most of the concerns we have probably run, focus on the financial or the behavioral. So I'll do the structural real fast. Structural is you buy a property and you want to reconvert the tenant base. And so you want everybody to move out. So then you don't renew the lease. And when they don't renew the lease, they have to move out. However, if they don't move out, that's when you get to uh, reasons to evict because you're changing over the asset. But in that case, the emotion of that is that you're trying to accomplish your business plan. On the behavioral side, I often think about this as cause and effect. I've done, they've done A, I must do B. I try very hard to determine the proof of the behavior. I don't make uh, unallocated uh, statements and I don't try to push somebody to do something. I look for facts and only facts. So I do this from a very focused perspective that says what happened, what did not happen. And I go that direction. Uh, on lease break issues and behavioral issues, often the issues create and affect the value of the property. And it can be determined based on the value of the tenant. 
And what do I mean by that? Is it a long-term tenant that's paying under market rate and you want to have them move out? Is it a tenant that is just moved in, has already caused problems? Those all factor into the go, no go. And in all of these, the lease is key. I, I can't stress enough the, the power and benefit of having a great lease. A great lease creates the rule book that everyone agrees to. And that's really key to understanding exactly what your expectations are and what the other person's expectations are. And if you go to the financial and the lack of payment, for me, these are really emotionally draining because I feel like I might be kicking somebody out of their house just because I hit a hard time. And there, but for the grace of God, go I. I always focus on those under the golden rule of what happens if I end up in their place. And the answer I come back to time and time again is if I end up in that place, I want to be treated as an adult. I want to be given as much grace as is fair. And I want to have the ability to fix or cure the problem. Funny thing, the courts are very much the same way in that. So behavioral David, evictions, I kind of covered all this, sorry. and I'll speed through some of this. Yes? Before you move on, uh, there's yeah. an interesting story in the chat that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, Nguyen says, uh, a friend of mine once had a neighbor repeatedly call the police on him because he said his kids made too much noise. The landlord decided not to renew his lease. The problem was that no one would rent to him again. He was practically homeless with kids despite a well-paying job at Intel. Whatever background check they would uh, they would do would flag him as a problem tenant. So what ended up happening is he eventually got the police reports for all the police calls and discovered that they all cited him and not the neighbor who complained. He took those reports and threatened a lawsuit against his former landlord if they didn't fix the info in his record, and then they promptly fixed the problem. So the moral here is don't assume that if a tenant often has stops being pulled up against him, then he's the problem. He will pick up a nice call and call. What's your take on this? Yeah, so that is exactly the kind of situation I mentioned as one of my biggest mistakes was not figuring out who was lying to me first. And so in this situation, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. In this situation, uh, the two tenants are disagreeing. And so the best thing to do is to try to be neutral as best you can. And that's clearly, this is the good and the bad and the ugly of being a landlord is that sometimes you get held accountable for other people's actions. And it sounds like the friend did exactly the right thing by fixing the record. And it it makes sense that he wasn't the one disparaging. I don't know if that addresses the concern enough or if you think I should talk about that more. Well, no, I mean, it, it, it kind of addresses it. I guess the issue is, you know, the landlord really wasn't in a position to decide who was the problem. And unless perhaps they could have requested the police records, but the well, you should definitely if there's if there's a police call to any of my properties, I always read the police records. Okay, so that that's probably always what should have done before and, and, before putting him off as a problem tenant. Yeah, and that goes back to that idea of not knowing who's lying to you, because if person A is complaining and person B is complaining. Inherently, somebody's going to be using from a, an old sales word of puffery, right? Someone's going to be just portraying the truth a little bit more aggressively than maybe it is. And so when you go down and you ask the local municipality, hey, can I see the police report? They A, get to know that they've got a landlord that cares. And B, you get to see what a third party said. And I'm all about finding the third party because the third party allows me to, to, to also recognize where someone's being disingenuous. And I think that's a big part of this. You know, there's a saying that uh, salespeople lie all the time or used car salesman's always gonna lie to you. Tenants often lie. It just, it's just a fact, in, fact of life. It doesn't mean you have to go at it negatively, but if there's a risk of being labeled as a bad tenant, they're gonna do everything they can to avoid doing that. And maybe lie is the wrong term. Maybe the better term is misrepresent or misspeak. And so that's a big part of this is figuring out what the truth is from the get go. Oh, thanks. You bet. And as we go through the idea of the reasons to, to evict, that's definitely a behavioral issue. Too much noise, kids causing too much noise. By the way, there's a phrase in most leases that talks about quiet enjoyment. And quiet enjoyment is not a volume of sound, 
quiet enjoyment is a legal term that means that I, as a landlord, have the right to allow you to use the property as you see fit. It's a, one of those old common law English terms that is kept on. And so quiet enjoyment is not, does not have anything to do with volume. And when you get into music issues and volume issues, you can also put in your lease that someone can't play over a certain decibel. Be careful about that because if you put something in your lease over a certain decibel, then you got to be able to measure the decibels. So just be aware of that. Yeah, I was going to ask, what, what are some key points in a good lease? What are some key points in the lease? Uh, was that the question? Yes. Okay. So key points from a behavioral side, outlaw what you don't want done. So in Colorado, where I live, marijuana is legal. Growing marijuana is legal. So if I say no drugs, no illegal drugs, that allows for marijuana to be grown. Now, if you grow marijuana in Colorado, you can have up to, I think it's seven house plants. The, the risk to the property is tremendous. So I have to specifically outlaw no private grow plants in Colorado, or you can outlaw no, no firearms on the property, or you can outlaw no animals over X number of weight, or you could say no cats. As long as you say no cats to everybody, you can have no cats. If you say no cats to Asians and you say yes cats to Hispanics, you can't do it because you're creating favoritism. So you just pick your uniformity and you stick with it. Uh, other big things, no changing locks, no changing appliances, no changing uh, light fixtures. A lot of that stuff is, is really crucial. I had a tenant who came in and changed all the lights to ceiling fans with remote controls, then moved out. So my lights were thrown away. My ceiling fans were, were there, but I didn't have any controls for them. So I had to change them all again anyway. So those can all be behavioral issues. And the behavioral issue could be uh, that they haven't maintained the shrubbery to the HOA requirement. And I would always have, if you have property that's within an HOA, a rule that says they must follow HOA guidelines and if they, there's any HOA complaints, they must address them, cure them, and or pay the fines. So I hope that helps a little bit. If you're creating a behavioral eviction, that's where they're breaking the rules that you guys made in your lease. Those are really simple. It's a proof of fact. And in COVID, I would evict under behavioral issues long before I would evict under financial issues. The moratorium often doesn't evolve it doesn't stop behavioral evictions. Financial evictions can be stopped and have been stopped. And you think about financial, it's not paying rent. And these are the ones where you have those real big pains. Uh-oh, I'm making somebody homeless. No, you're not. You're not the person not paying their bill. It's really important as I go through this to stop and think about the series of decisions that have been made to get to that place. And this might sound arrogant, and I don't mean it to, but did they go to college and get a degree? Did they choose to work at company A as opposed to pursue work with company B? Did this person choose to rent when they could have bought? Did this person make a bad life choice that forced them to get a felony, therefore they have to live in this place? There's a natural cause and effect to people's income and their, and their value financially inside a society. And so for me, I work very carefully to make sure I don't judge one way or the other if those behaviors were good or bad. I just look at the consequence of the choices. And then I also think about the system. The system says there are two cure periods at least, one with notice, one with ruling. That gives them time to fix it. If they come to me and they say, hey, David, I have a problem. The problem is that I lost my job because of the pandemic and I was a waitress and I can pay you $50 this week and I'll pay you $50 next week. And here are the jobs I'm looking for. You bet I'm going to work with that person. If the person dodges my phone calls, won't talk to me, tells me it's got the checks in the mail. Three days later, the check's still not there. It tells me, oh, I went to Walmart to get a money order and the money order line was closed. And then I went to, had to go to Walgreens to get it. No, no, 
they're just full of it and I don't bother with that. So a lot of it stems to behavior. And I also think of financial evictions like a scope of work or a contract. What happens as an employee if you don't follow your scope of work or you don't follow the project assessment that you're working on? There's a system. There's a negotiation between the employer and the employee. There's a negotiation between the customer and the vendor. There's always compromise. There are always delays and they take more resources. And the same happens with non-payment. You negotiate, you compromise. There's usually delay and there's usually a requirement for more resources. So in the case of an eviction where you've got non-payment and the person's looking for a job, I often ask what they're looking for. Do I have anybody in my network I can help them connect to a job? So I do what I can within my world. Am I going to go outside of my behavioral world to call my best friend's sister and say, you got to hire this person? No. But am I going to say, I know that this Dairy Queen over here is looking for people? Yes. And that's what you do as a part of a corporation as well, as you try to work within the system that you've got to make it to where you don't have to elevate it to a next level or a third level concern. Then after I look at the, co- I look at the financial eviction as a contract, I, I then back up and I say, have I done my part? Have I fulfilled everything? Have I repaired everything on time? Have I, have I executed all of my promises? If the answer is yes, I look back to cause and effect, culpability. Who's doing what wrong? I don't try to place blame because placing blame doesn't get me to an outcome. It just creates an excuse. And so I respond from what I try to do with all tenants similarly. So if I have a group where there's a tenant that is looking for a job and I give them a suggestion, I'll give the same suggestion to every other tenant. I've helped people write resumes before, so I'm not heartless. But what I am is direct and clear and candid. And then I often think about what's the desired outcome. At the end of the day, being a landlord is about deciding if you want the tenant to stay in your properties or go. If the desire is to have the tenant go, I often work toward that desired outcome. If the desired outcome is to be current, I will work very carefully with them to help get them current. There's a lot of municipalities right now and the CARES Act that was just signed uh, or the American Rescue Act, I think is the name of the, the bill that was just passed, Cre- creates and provides for further financing for people that are having a hard time paying their bills. So I would give them references to that. I had another couple who was uh, retired and they were making $24,000 a year on retirement benefits. And in Denver, you can't pay rent on that. So I helped refer them over to uh, the Medicaid offices and to the Section 8 housing, which ha- allows them to get subsidized subsidized housing from, this, from the asset, from, from the municipality, pardon me. So I always look, look through those parts of it to really help know that I've done some things to help them while still behaving within boundaries. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Yes, go ahead. There was a good question in the chat from Anita. Um, How do you go about changing a long-term tenant relationship from a friendship to more of a strictly business one without seeming like a jerk? Ooh, well, the first part of that question, the how-to is if you've decided that you want to be a business relationship more than a friendship relationship, it becomes a whole lot easier. If the decision is you want to be a friend and a boss, you know, there's a there's a phrase heavy as a heavy as a head that wears the crown and a landlord. You wear a crown. It's called a landlord because literally during the Middle Ages, the people who own the land were the lords and they wore the crowns. And so that language is really relevant to that question. I'd say the first part is you draw boundaries and the boundaries are going to be. Let's just use female names for this one. Sally, you need to pay your rent on time. Sally, this is a business for me. I love you as a person. I'm going to split our relationship into two elements. One is going to be the person. One is going to be the the tenant. And I never refer to myself as a landlord. I always refer to myself as either property manager or as an investment advisor or as an investor. Because if you say landlord, that just brings up bad connotations. So I say I'm the property manager. And I often won't tell the tenants that I own the property because they don't need to know that. 
and they're writing a check to an LLC anyway, so they don't need to know whether I own it or not. And that creates a little bit of distance in this. Where you can, that's a good solution. Hey, I'm just the property manager. I'll talk to them about this. I'll see what the owner says. They don't need to know the difference. Back to the friend though, for a second, what I would say is really create the boundary that says, this is a business. I have to work on the business of this. And just like I support you, I support the business. I hope that helps kind of address the concern a little bit. Um, yeah, and then there's another question. Uh -huh. um, how to handle situations where a partial payment agreement was done, but tenant moves out and does not make payments for agreements. Tenant does not respond to emails, certified letters, et cetera. Is it worth going to court, paying a lawyer to try and get rent payments? How much money are we talking about? That's the question I would ask first and foremost. Is it enough of a pain in the butt factor for me to walk away from it? Or am I happy the person's gone and I can move on? Also think about it from a business outcome. Do you write that loss off? You can write that loss off. I'm not a tax guy. I'm not gonna give you tax advice, but David would write that loss off against his books. And that would allow me to not have to pay income tax on a subsequent set of revenues just different ways to skin the cat. And on that one, really it's about how much is involved from the pain effect and the cost benefit analysis. So if the small claims in that municipality is capped at $5,000 and you can file a small claims court and you wanna spend the three hours it takes to learn it and the five hours it takes to get the money back, more power to you. For me, I'm not gonna go after that unless it's gonna be probably north of $7,000 because I know that's going to cost me 40 hours of emotional pain. And if my worth of per hour is $100, it's going to cost me $4,000 in emotional pain. And instead, I can look forward as opposed to looking backward. So I typically err on the process of cutting bait and running on some of that stuff. Thank you. You bet. So uh, back to the fault for a second. I really look at the decision making. I think I've kind of driven this, this, this home and you guys have been able to read this slide. So I'm gonna skip on to the next part of it, which is how do I look at the decision making? Are the responsibilities similarities versus the resultant response? So if the consequence is A, I have to think to myself, I'm not God. I didn't cause this, I didn't make it. I can't fix their problem for them. I am not there to fix their problem. I am there to create to deliver a product. Much like if you're developing a software solution and the software has glitches, you don't say the whole solution is bad and you don't say that it's all perfect either. You work within your scope to fix it to the best of your ability. It's the same with owning and operating property. And it's like job performance. And the job performance as a tenant is to pay your bills on time, to do what you say you're gonna do, to communicate well, and that's the resultant response is they do their work, I do mine. I really look at this in those kind of ways. If they're honest with me, they get great responses. If they lie to me, all bets are off and I will use the full force of the law. And I, I can sleep cleanly and easily at night because I know that when they move in, I say to them, I say to every tenant when they move in, be honest with me and we can solve problems. Lie to me and you're done. And I always tell them that. So that goes into setting expectations in the beginning. When you do a lease application, when I, when I do a lease application, when I do a, a tenant background check, I always say to them, thanks for the application, what am I gonna find? I had a couple tell me they are gonna find four felonies and the guy just got out of prison. And I said, okay, what'd you learn? And the guy couldn't answer it. So the fact that he couldn't answer it is why I didn't accept him as a tenant, not the fact that he had felonies. Because if he'd been able to say to me, I learned that what I did was wrong and I learned that I need to fix my life and I learned that this is the first step, I would have been very open to what his needs were. But when he wasn't able to take responsibility, I was able very cleanly to say, okay, it's not gonna work for us. To that end, I also put out there that if there's a felony, it's got to be within greater than five years, and it has to be a non-violent, non-sexual felony. 
Um, and then I look at behavior past and present. What's happened? Have they lied to me? Have they not lied to me? Have they paid their bills on time? Have they not paid their bills on time? And those actions are far more descriptive to me of my response. If they I have a tenant who actually had a dirt front yard and the next door had uh, dogs that they had ruined the front yard, I put in the same sod the same day, three years later, the person with the dog had ruined two more yards. The person that had raked their dirt before I ever put in sod has this beautiful large landscape. Person with a beautiful yard loses their job and they say, I need help. I gave them help. Person with the dog said, you need to put in another yard. I said, no. So those actions of taking care of the yard, taking care of or not taking care of the yard created the problems. If there had been a track where the dogs had run back and forth, but they'd watered the yard, I wouldn't have been upset because that's a dog. That's just what happens. But those behaviors create the response. And from that, that whole decision-making tree allows me to know that nothing happened overnight that got them where they were and that they're going to be punished for just bad luck. They got there because of a series of choices. And that's a big part of the emotional part of it. And then I have to know and I have to remind myself in the business of housing people, the bad outcomes sometimes really are unavoidable. And I go through everything to remind myself that the process leads, leads here. And it's not up to me to respond, to tell you how to respond to life. It's not up to me to teach you how to respond to life. It's up to me to provide you a product and up to you to take care of it. And uh, the hula hoop, I was taught a long time ago to put a hula hoop on the ground and stand in it. And if I stand in the hula hoop and I pick that hula hoop up and I hold it around my waist, those are the things that I can control. I can control me. I can't control my, the other person. And that's very much the, the boundary that I put up in landlording in real estate is I can't control what the other person does. I get to control how I feel, how I act and what I do with it. So from the emotional side, I talk about it a lot. I've got a network of people that I talk to and we will literally, literally compare crazy stories. And that allows us to be able to not judge them, but just understand that life is different for everybody. And that not everybody responds to the adversity the same. So that's the end of the presentation. Uh, I know there are questions. I'm sure, I hope there are questions for everybody. And so I thought I'd throw the rest of the conversation up to um, the group to kind of go through it, more specific conversations. So we went through all the chat questions uh, during okay. your presentation. So if there are any other questions, please feel free to use the chat. But at this point, feel free to unmute and, and just really talk. OK, there is a question. Can we get a copy of the presentation? Would that be OK, David? With you? Absolutely. Happy to, happy to share it. And I'm happy to answer any questions you guys may have. Uh, Really, the way I look at this is that if you ignore the emotions, you're going to get yourself all pinched up and wound up and get messy. You have to work through the emotions and you have to let somebody understand that you're being it's a business transaction. That might sound like an excuse, but the reality is that this is a business. And if someone doesn't fulfill their covenant, then there is a referee to help fulfill the covenant. And when that person committed suicide on my property and they blame me, it was really hard. I had to talk to my pastor about it. I had to talk to my friends. I had to talk to uh, the neighbors. I actually ended up having to deal with the estate because she was a hoarder. And we had to talk to the coroner. And I finally came to recognize that her actions were not responsible I was not responsible for her actions. I didn't cause her to be unemployed. I didn't cause her to, to not take her medicine. I didn't cause her to decide that dying was more valuable to her than talking to me, if that makes sense.
All right. Any any questions? Um, David, I have a question. If you've had to call out the sheriff to evict someone, could you just talk through what that yeah. looks like and your experience with that? Well, it's an ugly day, right? So every municipality, once again, has their own rules. So I'm going to talk about Colorado because that's I know that one the best. And I've done it in Michigan as well. And that was a totally similar experience. So typically, the sheriff will tell you a period of time they will come to it. And you let the sheriff drive the bus. You typically have to have a team of laborers or movers to move the person's possessions out of the dwelling. And most of the time, the possessions have to go onto a curb or the yard, and they have to sit there for a period of time before you can discard them. You have a right to the property that's in, that you own. You do not have a right to their personal property. So that's why the prop. That's why their personal possessions are put on the curb. Or in the ground so that the tenant can move them somewhere else. Uh, generally what happens is a sheriff and you agree on a time, you already posted a notice on the door, you give them three days, you've gone to court, the judge has entered a, a, a writ, which is a ruling that says you have the right to possession again, a writ of possession, and then the sheriff uh, comes in, knocks on the door, if the person's there, they tell them, and the person throws a fit, and that's why the sheriff's there. And the sheriff usually has one or two deputies with them. And then you literally have the movers come in and move all their stuff out. Every sheriff's department has a little different behavior on how they do it, but typically you have a window of one to two hours. And if I'm the landlord, I'm gonna show up in the first 10 minutes, and then I'm gonna come back two hours later, make sure it's done. I'm not gonna stand there the whole time because I don't need that pain. It, you know, I'm very good at the idea of delegating that responsibility to other people as well. And I am not the expert and that's why the sheriff has the gun and that's why I do not. Does that help? Yeah, that was great, thank you. Okay, other thoughts, questions, concerns? All right, there's another question from Satish. How to handle situations where long-term, five plus years tenants are unable to pay rent due to loss of job for many months? We have considered partial payment rent agreement, but our prior experience with another tenant was not encouraging. So I would go through a couple decision trees. The first decision tree was, do I want this person to be here or not? Second would be, is this an opportunity for me to have them move out and raise the rent to market? Because if they're five years, if they've been a tenant for five years, chances are that you're missing some rental income. And so I would also say, um, and I'll get to the cops question next. I saw that one pop up. On the um, question from Satish, I would also have to make the decision, do I want them to be a tenant? That's the first decision. If the answer is yes, you work with them and you give them a, a boundary of time period. So let's say that you say to them, okay, you're gonna continue to accrue rent over a window of six months, you can pay that rent back. So let's say that your rent's a thousand dollars, then you're gonna owe me, you know, $1,800. You're gonna owe me an extra, I, I, my math is failing me right now, 200 bucks a month for five months on a thousand bucks. So you're gonna owe me an extra 180 bucks a month above your normal pay. If they've lost a job, that's really not your problem. And it doesn't say that they lost a job due to COVID. So what I would say is I work on a, trying to create a rent agreement and I make that rent agreement really specific. And I would say, if you miss it by a period of two days or three days, and I would call that cure period out in the lease, you will be evicted. And I'll put that boundary very clearly in there. And so I would say, okay, here's the payment plan. You must pay me X number of dollars every week or every other week. In the event that one payment is missed, this is what will happen. And I would put that in the document. So it's bulletproof. And that way you also go to the courts if you have to evict them and you say to the judge, your honor, here's what it would happen. We agreed on this. They didn't fulfill it. I have no choice. 
as to how do you know if the cops were called on the rental investment property? I usually make friends with a neighbor. And if I own a duplex, I'll go meet the guys across the street. And I'll say, hey, if there's ever a problem, here's my car, call me. And I go to the house next door and the house on the other side. And, you know, people are nosy and they love good gossip. And that's to your advantage as a, as a property owner. And, and I will often be told by either a tenant or a neighbor, hey, Saturday night, the cops are over here. OK, hey, police department, what happened? And that's how I find out often. Other questions? Got a couple of thank yous. Yeah, good. Well, I hope that helps uh, with some value for you guys. Uh, I know a, a couple pieces of advice. I did the personal management so I could learn what I was going to do as a real estate professional. If I am a professional in another industry, I will pay somebody else to manage my property as if at all possible because it creates a barrier in there. I might lose a little bit of return, but I gain a lot of freedom. And that's a big advice task I would give to all of you. If it's, if it's more than two or three properties, that's about the max I think a, a part-time person can manage. Otherwise, it just becomes too overbearing. And if it's more than 10 properties, you definitely don't want to try to do it yourself. It's too much hassle. Thanks, David. Uh, Glenn said thanks, and Anita said this is very helpful. So, so I hope that helps everybody. And my name and number and email are on the bottom. Feel free to reach out. Yes. So uh, if you're managing the property yourself and if you have like you know, multiple requests for tenants, right? Mm -hmm. And you're screening them, right? So one might stand out really good, but the others may not have like you know, really uh, good reasons to say no, right? So uh, do we have to provide a reason why you have not picked them? Or, um... you, okay, so that's a fair housing question, right? So there are federal fair housing guidelines in the US and then there are state housing guidelines. And Jay, I'll come to your question in a second. Um, on the federal fair housing guidelines, you can't discriminate there are seven, but I think about it as eight. You can't, you can't discriminate based on race, religion, familial status, uh, creed, occupation, sex, gender, marital, uh, marital status. In, in other words, you can't discriminate. If you think about it in those terms, you're always gonna follow within the law. So telling somebody no can create a reason that you discriminate telling somebody I decided to go with a more qualified candidate would also create a reason to discriminate. So what I would say is I'm sorry I have multiple applications and at this time I'm running to somebody else. Think about it, if you're a hiring manager, it's the same as hiring a candidate. You tell the candidate whatever you can that's legal, you may not tell them everything that might not be the best thing for the candidate, but it's the best thing for you. This is not a job where we're gonna self-actualize this is a job where we're going to protect our assets and grow our net worth. So hopefully that helps you. I wouldn't. I, I don't say, well, your debt to income ratio was not three x, and the other tenants' debt to income ratio was four x, so they've got more money. I'm never going to say that, sure. right? And I'm not going to say, well, that person didn't bathe and you did bathe, so I'm going to give you the lease. Never going to say it. So I often just say there are multiple candidates, and unfortunately at this time, I'm going to lease it to someone else. Well, why? Well, I'm really not going to get into the specifics of that, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, because it's not really relevant. The decision has been done and the lease has already been executed. Have a great afternoon. Now, because of that, I also don't take lease applications from everybody. If I know I'm never going to take their application, if I know I'm never going to lease to them, I'll say to them, don't bother applying. I've already got seven applications. They're going to be fine. So that's kind of the, the, my polite way to, to kill the deal. And then I know okay. we're coming up on it. So on the good property management, I think it's like finding any good hire. You figure out what it is that you want and you test two or three companies. One of the things I look for most is, are they upcharging for repairs? What do they repair? How do they repair? Upcharging is a typical model. 
15 percent is not crazy it's a little bit fat maybe the upcharge should be 10. Uh, the typical ratio in colorado right now for good property management is from eight to ten percent of gross collected rents per month uh, if they're trying to charge you 15 percent because you're a one door person i wouldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole if you interview them and you don't like them walk away if they are responsive that's really important figure out how that communicates key so you send them an email to test them that's what i often do i test it or i look for referrals from other friends so it's just like hiring an employee i test it are you going to follow the the are you going to communicate well are you going to write a good thank you note are you going to answer your call on time if you're 15 minutes late for the appointment you're done right so that's, those are a lot of the ways I screen it for almost anything I do in my businesses is, are you punctual? Are you honest? I can work through almost anything else. All right, and we are at the top of the hour. So thanks everyone for calling in. Thank you, David. I uh, really appreciate you coming and sharing you. your perspective with us. Yeah, if anybody has any questions or, or further, feel free to ping me and I'm happy to respond on a one-on-one -on -one basis. All right, thanks, David. Thank you. Um, have a good uh, rest of your Friday and everyone else too.